school here to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I'll go ahead and welcome up Mr. Keith Lipsy and his group representing uh, our Guys and Ties group. And you'll learn more about Guys and Ties here in just a little bit during the uh, student minute. But if they want to go ahead and stand right here with me. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And if we could, I'd like our guys to just introduce themselves real quick so you know uh, some names to put with these faces. And I'll start talking. My name is Todd. My name is Aiden. My name is Jair. Uh, my name is William. Keith Lipsy. <laughs> <laughs> Very nice, guys. Thank you so much. Thank you, guys. guys. Like I said, you'll get to learn a little bit more about what these guys do every Wednesday with Mr. Lipsy here in just a minute. So, thanks, guys. Thank, thank, thank you, guys. guys. Thank you to your families for having you here. Yes. All right. Um, we have a choir concert tonight that has um, changed some schedules for some people. So Mr. Love is going to give his building update now, I believe, after he takes a quick photo. <laughs> Thanks for accommodating. Absolutely. All right, so we got some exciting stuff going on at BIS as we get closer and closer to the end of the first semester. One of the things really excited about is the Share Your Christmas mentioned down in the board report. Student Council does that every year, and uh, they kind of had to put it together pretty quick this year. But Jeannie Francisco and recruit did a great job. You'll see them out bell ring at Walmart here in a couple weeks. So make sure to drop by, wave at them. Um, I mentioned this a couple times here, but I am really excited about some of the opportunities that uh, since we have approved career ladders, some of the things that we're seeing. Uh, one of the things I noted here is I was very shocked to see how many intermediate school students were excited about chess, or chess, <laughs> but I was excited to go by and see the other night uh, all those kids having fun, excited about uh, that chess program, so that's really cool they're staying after them for that. Um, and then we did have another meeting with our consultant, Dr. Eric Waddell, uh, regarding our PLC work that we're doing. There's a lot of ways that uh, he pushed our thinking in, in good ways to continue to think about how to refine those practices. But uh, I want to brag on our teachers how they're uh, just taking some new ways of looking at student data, evidence, and learning on a week by week basis and making sure that that's informing their next steps and the interventions we're doing with kids. So I'm really, really excited about that. And then the last thing I'd say is uh, try to make it out to our STEAM night, which happens on December 6th. Uh, that's a great event. We did it last year, Christmas themed. It was a ton of fun. Uh, Christine O'Neill and Ashley Cavaness and Tristan Bennett, they've been putting a lot of work in on planning that night, making it a real great night for families. Uh, food and fun, so we'd love to see you. Any questions? Enjoy the concert. Absolutely. Um, yes. Are we going to talk about the guys with ties? Uh, yes, the student minute. I believe that's up next. It's coming up after the consent agenda. Oh, I thought. I just thought he was going to do everything right now so that he could go to the yeah, concert. Yeah, that's fine if you want. Can we go and watch. Can we? Yeah. Sorry, I was just trying to get you out the door. Yeah. And Mr. Love, what time does that steam night start on December 6th? Uh, I believe the time on that is 5.30, but let me double check and get back on that. Perfect. Thank you, Sharon. Guys and Ties started a few years back with Ty Smith, who is the assistant principal, for students to uh, come in and learn about manners and and etiquette and then just how to be gentlemen. Sometimes just being a kid, you, you don't you really learn about them until later on in life. And I just think it's a, a good opportunity to start young. And I said, hey, what if we started something for the girls? 
And so what sounds like guys and ties. So I thought, gosh, what could girls wear? And so we came up with girls and girls. If you're going to her house, be respectful of property and privacy. Our curriculum is written by the American Girl Company and it's written just for girls in these intermediate school ages. We also read a book about Wally and it taught us how not to be worried all the time or your life will be the best. We're doing a study right now on manners and um, just talking through things like proper phone etiquette and letting others go before you um, through the door and giving your seat to a senior adult. And today you should say, it's nice to meet you, Abigail. It's nice to meet you, Okay, I know it's tricky, but it's nice to look at people's eyes when you talk to them when you're meeting them for the first time, okay? We have to learn about manners because we don't want to be like rude people because we can do something like if you're just a mean person, um, that's not going to get your friends or anyone to like you personally. Five pounds. Okay. Whoa. Ooh. Most of the things that we do are games or fun activities that, I, again, I try not to say, hey, this is what we're working on. This is our focus. Uh, but through it, we get to work on teamwork. Uh, like we, we built the bridges where they are working on uh, teamwork and communicating with one another. Uh, they have their ideas and they want to do their own thing. Well, it's their responsibility to, as a team, work together to be able to communicate. You have any ideas of, oh, there you go. In the end, I hope they're, they become leaders. I hope that they, when they wear their tie and their shirts, people see them and they see them as um, important. We always say, girls and girls are leaders. And so I'm always encouraging them when I see them in the hallway, remember girls and girls are leaders and they are so proud to be in Girls and Girls. Um, they take on that leadership role. Yes, Abigail. You can do them both help. You can do two things at once. How do you kind of help some of the others do just start? So, um, so um, I try to help them by making them comfortable with me. You kind of be nice to them and if they miss it, you can catch them up. Someone said something that was interesting, right? Uh, I appreciate that. So there's a lot of growth there. So we'll keep doing it. When we are guys in ties, and when they get their ties and they get their shirts, uh, people are going to be looking for them for leadership. So I hope um, as they move forward, you know, the things that we talk about in the class, the manners, uh, they they follow through to the next day in school, you know, and then for the following year. So um, just hoping to see growth from, from there. It's been neat to see them grow. And it just makes me feel like, you know, that hour we spend here um, makes a difference each week. It's um, an hour that I just get to pour into each of those lives and build relationships with them and hopefully see them feel really confident when they go to fix with them today. Great. I am very grateful for that because they helped me throughout like this half, this whole school year and the, the whole life of been in school. They've helped me. They're gonna. They're gonna be the ones that help me to have a better future too. Uh, just a few words on both those programs. I want to brag on Keith Lipsy and Courtney Stanford. This is something that they've just done um, for a while now. Um, you know, without compensation, just doing it because they know it matters. They care about kids, so I want to brag on them for doing that. Um, and then I'd also say one of the things was mentioned with all the guys in ties. Uh, you know, one of the things that's a big deal to those uh, young men is learning to tie their own tie. In fact, we had one of our guys out here that was tying his tie, and his dad offered to help. And he goes, "No, I'm going to do it." You know? <laughs> so uh, it's just a cool thing for them to take on some some responsibility. And you know, uh, they do they do see themselves as leaders in the school because of this. So it's a really really valuable thing we have here. I'm really thankful to. Courtney and Keith. So, any questions? All right, thank you for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Before we do that, I have a commendation for Mike because he is our newest board member and he has completed all of his new board member training. So I have this certificate for you that I trust you'll frame and hang in your home. Absolutely. And um, 
I just want to say thank you for all that you've done and being part of our board and um, your training public. And thank you for going yeah. to. Okay, now you can do accommodations. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's accommodations, yes. We have some accommodations to recognize tonight. Um, via, over at BMS, we have Mac Rich, who placed first first in the Class 4 Middle School State Cross Country Championship. And then we have Kaylin Bayless, um, second, second in the Class 4 Middle School State Cross Country Championship. And then Thomas Henderson placed third in Class 4 Middle School State Cross Country Championship. And then BMS team as a whole got fourth place in the cross country. So we want to give congratulations to Mr. Potter you pass that on from the board and board here that we're very excited and proud for the, their accomplishment this past season. So, and the coaches as well. Um, Cody Young was will, will be recognized in the school school band and orchestra magazine for representing Missouri in, the, in their upcoming 50, 50 directors who make a difference issue. So make sure you run out and grab your copy of that. So. Um, over at BHS, um, over the weekend, uh, we had 20 choir students, uh, honor choir students, go to Evangel, and they performed in the honor choirs. It was a wonderful performance and a great uh, day overall. Um, and senior director, I'm sorry, senior Jack Roger was also selected for Missouri All State Choir, and will be performing with this choir in January. This is the highest honor for high school musical music students to receive, and we are so very pleased and proud of him. It's, it has been a great to have these districts and state events back again this year in person. Also, thank you to Polk County um, Library for giving books to the for, to VHS and the Bolivar Librarians um, presentation at the MSB Fall Conference. I just want to say personally, they did a fantastic, wonderful job. For those who got to, to hear that as a board members who were able to attend the MSBA conference this year, um, our librarians did a fantastic job and, and very, very proud of them. Mm -hmm. So, and then we had some FFA students up there representing us as well, MSBA Fall Conference as well. Um, Mr. King, uh, and Ms. Brown. Did a great job in the end. all the students as well. It was great to see them up in Columbia, uh, Kansas City, not Columbia, from town. Um, and then the following FMA students um, for area fall speaking, um, Ashton Cowden, um, Michaela Methvin, Ellie Sam, Caleb Simpson, Emma Goodman, Ben Reynolds, Mary Grace Warden, Emma Hancock, and Aubrey Funk. I just want to say on behalf of the board how excited we are for students to see these achievements. Um, and personally, I just want to say I'm I'm to the moon and back at these accomplishments and representing Bolivar and uh, I will say about the FFA students up at uh, the uh, MSBA conference I was just so impressed with their uh, their booth and just their professionalism and just and all the kiddos it was just fun to uh, Dr. Azan yeah the two of us um, hung out in one station for a little while and it was it was it was fun so yeah you know, congratulations to all of those folks Okay, moving on to the consent agenda. So Yes. Okay. We should have employment recommendations for a food service and a custodian. Okay. We have a motion to approve the employment for classified as follows. Misty Duty, Lisa Meeks, Elaine Moore, Christina White, and Joseph Porch. So moved. Second. All those in favor? All right. We do have two extra duty assignment uh, to approve. Uh, we recommend Shannon Summers for uh, assistant wrestling, and then AJ Lynn, and this is a uh, associate, <clears throat> excuse me, an associate coach position, and that's based on some of our middle school numbers um, and A B games. So that would be for that particular duty. Motion. So moved. Second. Favor. Uh, recommendation we have uh, substitutes in a variety of different areas uh, some of these are teacher substitutes some are in food service okay I have a motion to approve the substitutes as listed 
Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. We'll see some updates and reports. Uh, we already had our student teacher minute. We'll move on to our A plus program. Yes. I love the girls and pearls and guys and pies. That's employability skills. That's right. Dr. I know. <laughs> yeah, we're ready our Starting early. early. <laughs> we need to. So, uh, if you're looking at the A plus, uh, the goal that I had was I wanted to look at the pandemic numbers from 2020 to 2023, and kind of seeing where we're at. Obviously, we're not quite to 23, but the projection of the senior class to see where the GPAs fall and where the attendance was, because I was afraid we had less students participating. And actually, if you look at the numbers, we actually have more. So I think that's exciting. Well, we do have a few in those numbers that are showing as being slightly under GPA. We're hopeful that they will get their GPAs up by May and be able to pull that out which would put us at having 97 at this time. Now that could change. There is some slight variability there with if schedules get changed by counselors and that kind of thing. So those numbers aren't completely firm, but they're a good projection. So um, the other thing, uh, the current focus right now is that students need to have their 50 hours of tutoring. Up to 12.5 hours of that can be community service hours. Um, there are no pandemic waivers anymore in place. 95% uh, attendance is still required. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, you might remember that not, it was nine, had dropped to 90%. And so uh, the math requirements have been the big hot topic because what we're looking at is kids, these, this is the group of kids that did not take the Algebra 1 ELC because they would have taken it in 2020 or 2021 during the worst of the pandemic and so they do a lot of them do not have the algebra one eoc scores but the requirement has been put back in place because when governor parsons took away the waivers it put that back in place so it will literally take an act of the governor to change that so if the kids are graduating early they are going to need to make sure that they either have the algebra one eoc taken and make a proficient or above on it or have the ACT math score of 17 with a 2.5 GPA, 16 with a 2.8 GPA, or 15 with a 3.0 GPA. Um, so that's kind of the, one of the things that we're kind of watching and trying to make sure we've got those kids in line to either have that ACT score hopefully taken in, in place or they go back and take that Algebra 1 ELC, which is going to be kind of tough on some of them possibly because having taken the class so far back, but that's kind of where we are at this point. You know, Betty, Teresa Holt, we visited with her. She's developing a little bit of study session. That's gonna be a requirement that you down for one EMC in December, is to come to that study session and get caught at speed. Because you're right, it has been a semester or two for some of them that have had the course. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to work through that. Um, and. There could be something that comes down from the governor's office at some point, but we have some kids that are in line to graduate in December, and obviously we're not too far from that deadline, so we want to make sure we prepare them for that. Um, basically what we do with students to measure their success as they're working through this is every two weeks they turn in an A-plus log sheet. They are also logging in and out at every building so I can check one against the other. Every once in a while, there is a discrepancy, and we do challenge that. It really doesn't happen as often as you think. If there's a discrepancy, most of the time, it's that they forgot to put their end time on or something, and it messes up their calculations, and typically is an easy fix. But that is one of the things that we are watching and trying to make sure those test scores are in place so that their end attendance is in place. Uh, definitely have the tools that we need one of the things that i think is exciting is having the rudad counselor uh beginning in the use of the icap coming into play with counselors and, and the rudad counselor uh, to do those four-year plans because i think one of the challenges that we have with our students is 
the career focus and them knowing what they want to do. And while a lot of times ninth through twelfth graders do not know what they want to do, we, we've got to get try to get them on track to as close to that goal as we can uh, to prepare them for where, what they're going into. Uh, the future goals for the A-plus program, freshmen and sophomore students, these are just my recommendations. Uh, need more effort put into being informed about the A-plus scholarship program and the requirements need to be kept in front of them all four years, not just when they become seniors. And I think sometimes it doesn't get on their radar that, that quickly. I think parents kind of know about it, but I don't think the students are really paying attention to that. And that may be just because I've only been doing this since fall of 2020. So it may be because I've been seeing it through the pan eyes of the pandemic. So just keep that in mind as well. Uh, moving forward, I recommend that all juniors be taken to OTC to see their post-secondary options. Uh, we have sophomores at trip that sign up to go, but it's not all of them getting to see those programs that are available to them. One of the things that we know um, the pendulum's kind of swinging on the career thing, whether or not you need a four-year degree or not. We want to really prepare kids for what that next step is, whether it is a post-secondary option at OTC or another community college, for, perhaps, or the four-year plan, or just getting them ready to go right into the career and workforce. And so uh, making those options available to them and helping them just to realize what their options are. A uh, recommendation that more students be encouraged to take at least one semester of A plus in place of a senior seminar offering, uh, if we can get those GPAs where they can do that. And then there needs to be a concerted effort to excite students about career options earlier in their high school career. Also taking away any stigma that anything less than a four year college degree would help students be successful. And I, I know most of us feel that way, but I, I think it's something that we have to keep in front of us and really work toward to, to try to help those kids realize their success. Any questions for me? Yes? I have to last, in case they speak up. I, the, the recommendation, can you explain or, or take that a little bit, um, at least one semester of A plus in place of senior seminar? Right now, we have several seniors that are taking like two cement, two uh, blocks of senior sim. I think, it, and then some of them don't go ahead and try to take that A plus. I think if they're el anywhere close to eligible to being able to take that A plus, I think we need to really push in that direction. It just puts another tool in the tool belt. Even if they end up deciding they're not going to use it. They've got four years outside of high school. A lot can change in four years and decisions can be made. So uh, just equip their tool belt. And by doing that, what do you think that that, that does as far as benefiting students when, when we talk about, okay, we're one less of senior seminar, but we're replacing it with a an A plus section or well, when they take two senior seminars, they're only one of those is graded. Mm -hmm. So you're basically taking away a, a senior release time. Is really what you wouldn't be cutting down the content of senior seminar. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. It does. Okay. So it, I think it would just be better use of that time for them. Mm -hmm. I know they don't want. It's, there's many of them that don't want to spend a lot of time at school but they really need to spend that time at school and, and really get the things that they need to be successful once they get out of here too. And do you think that that might help us in meeting some of the GPA things that maybe some students are on the edge? Do you, do you think that would allow us some recovery time or intervention time with some of those students that are? I would hope so. Okay. Can you explain to me what a senior seminar class is? And what a plus, like the difference yeah, between yeah, if you, yeah. they should take one versus the other. Yeah. Years ago, we had just senior release time. We did not, uh, when, when that happened, we lost all the ADA funding for them not being in the classroom. So we create, it was created senior seminar before I took it over for them to do college and career readiness activities and that's what they do 
they, it's online, so they can leave school. They don't have to stay at school for that time frame. I think it's valuable. I think there may need to be some things tweaked as, as we're coming out of that pandemic mode. But um, I, I do think it's valuable for them, but I also think, I'm not sh I, I think if they're waiving their A+, plus, some of them, in play to get two senior seminars, I don't think that's a positive. I'm not saying that senior seminar is bad. Please understand me when I say that. Sure. I'm just saying, let's think about what, how, how many tools we're giving them in their tool belt. Sure. Yep. So. Yep. Okay. okay. That's a great job. Any other questions? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it. All right. Library and media. I'm going alone, but um, we did pre-record it, so we're going to play the video. She was pulling it up right now. Right where the, where the, uh, right in the middle. Nope, come over here, right down the street in the middle now. The blue, there you go. The Board of Education, um, this is our annual library review. We've seen all of you recently, so we'll try to be pretty brief. Uh, thank you again for attending, for those of you who attended our session at the Missouri School Board Association Conference. And that was really well received, and we've got lots of great feedback from that. And thank you for your continued um, involvement in our development of the policies and procedures, which I know we were here recently uh, discussing that as well last month. So really quickly, you had asked us to focus on uh, these things as kind of our evaluation strategies. Um, what is our current focus in our libraries? How are we measuring your work? Do we have all of the tools that we need? Maybe what can we have more of from you all or different supports? And then what are future goals within the Library and Media Center program? Um, so in terms of our current focus, a huge one is what we talked about last month, really making sure that we are developing really strong procedures that we know exactly what our responsibilities are, our next steps are when any sort of book is up for reconsideration or an official challenge. And I think we've done a pretty good job at clarifying those steps and making that a little more black and white for such a very nuanced gray um, area within our field. We're also continuing to review those commonly challenged books, and so we are keeping up to date with local schools and the books that are maybe being challenged or brought up for reconsideration there, and really gearing our focus to reading through those on our own ahead of time so we're familiar with the content that are, are within those titles. And per usual, we are also just continuing to build a, that community-wide level of reading, not just within our own buildings and within our own libraries, but within our entire district and then outside of that within our entire county. And in terms of how we are doing that, like here's some just quick evidence. Look at the, the fantastic work that's happening at BIS. Uh, we are also doing some new initiatives within our schools. All of us are doing a reading triathlon, so trying to get some involvement with students reading uh, the award nominees. Um, so in the high school, this is our flyer for that. Um, students read four of the Gateway nominees, uh, which is the high school level award, uh, four of the Dogwood Award nominees, which is the nonfiction titles, and then four of the Truman Awards, which is the middle school level four award winners. Uh, they read four of each of those, we call them a reading triathlete, and they will, will get a prize if they complete a form to verify that they've read those titles. So we've got the special displays and promotions going with that, which is fun. One thing I love that Melissa is doing in her building are these reading passports. Um, so there's different passports for different things, and students can get holes punched in the titles that they've read um, to verify that they're you know participating there. Um, there's just a lot of really good promotional stuff that we're we're doing to help continue to cultivate that that love of reading. In terms of how we are measuring that work, um, one statistic that we can easily turn to is our circulation data. Um, when comparing for the whole school year last year, so do keep that in mind, the top line you are seeing um, not even half of a school year yet. So that's our current stats from the start of the school year until now, the amount of books that have been checked out in each of our buildings. Um, and then the bottom number is was the entire school year. Um, 
so all the way from August until July of, of last year. So just kind of keeping, anytime we see those numbers dip, um, we can try to evaluate what's, what's changing, what do we need to, to look at to make sure that we're keeping those numbers consistent and hopefully climbing over time. Um, it is very normal, you'll see a huge dip at the high school level. Um, as students are far more involved um, in their working jobs, their time is so much more limited. Their books also get longer and there's more required reading in their classes. So we see a natural dip at the high school level. Um, but honestly, from my perspective, I would love to see for that number climb. Um, I think that it is a little low and I, I want to see that improve. Another thing too is our holds. So our holds are basically students going in, requesting a book that is not currently available and putting them on hold so that they can, can have that delivered to them. Naturally, not seeing a huge amount of that at the primary school level, which makes a lot of sense, uh, but we really see our students utilizing that more and more um, as they learn the ins and outs of destiny um, and have more identities developed as readers as well. So in terms of our future, we really want to continue to partner with the other schools in Polk, Polk County and the, the public library with our One County, One Author initiatives. Um, that's what we presented at the conference about, and we would like to continue to see that collaboration with all of those schools continue. We think it's really great for our community as a whole. We also want to continue to develop our craft as leaders within the library field. Uh, we are working on a proposal to present at the Missouri Association of School Librarians conference um, we want to be kind of those front runners sharing our ideas and our innovation uh, with other librarians in our state and in our country. And we would love to be applying for, uh, as a result of all of those things, the Desi Exemplary School Library status as well. But what do we need from you? Uh, here's a list of some things that could really help us in our practice and help us improve. Uh, one thing at the high school level that I think would be fantastic is if we could find a way for Foundations of Wellbeing, which is the class that I teach on, on my library day, uh, to meet outside of the library. Students and staff are getting very used to the fact that the library is closed down for two class periods. One of them is Reading Cafe, and that makes a little bit more sense, uh, but Foundations of Wellbeing, um, it does invade the library space and prevent students from accessing books because it is a very vulnerable class and we don't want people just trafficking in and out. Um, so I think that that is a problem for our high school statistics in terms of circulation um, and just accessibility to the materials within the library and the resources of our staff. Um, it also, I think, is a problem for the students and foundations of well-being because it is a very vulnerable and sometimes scary class to be in and being in that wide open space where you've got library workers kind of listening in or uh, staff coming in and out to make copies, it's very distracting and can be problematic to their productivity as well. Uh, we will also really need your continued trust and support as we navigate this new world of all these book concerns. Um, your support so far has been very helpful and anytime that you hear of concerns, please voice them to us. Um, and trust that we are really working on those policies and procedures and that we know the ins and outs of our library code of ethics, um, our demographics in our town and, and student population, um, and the, the books that are in our, our libraries. We also just need continued funding, um, so to be able to have the resources that we use regularly, uh, things that are pricey, um, but are so helpful for our schools. One of those, I would say, is we video. Um, we have that at the middle school and high school level, and I have seen uh, that impact my own personal family uh, in, in a fantastic manner. Um, my son is at MU right now, and he took our business management class and some multimedia classes, learned how to use we, we Video, and got hired on immediately as a freshman as part of the multimedia team filming and promoting the sports at MU. So he's on the sidelines of MU football and basketball games making the promotional uh, materials for the university because of the content he learned how to do here at, at VHS. And so, and is still in communication even with his prior teachers, getting more tips and tricks on how to improve his craft with that. So, and that came from a resource that our library was, was funding. Also, we would love time to collaborate as a team. It is very difficult to find that time with me teaching half-time, 
uh, with the teaching schedules at BIS, uh, BPS, and, and BMS. Trying to find that time in the day, we need substitute coverage sometimes to be able to have a day carved out where we can all be in the same room and really work on some of these things that need all of our heads around the table. Honestly, what that looks like right now is a lot of text threads and email communication back and forth where we're just communicating in, in, in print. Um, and we're like, okay, pass the baton to this person. Can you get this done today on this? This is what we need to do next. And I think we could maximize our output so much more if we just had a day uh, to really collaborate as a team. Um, also, we would love to be evaluated on a non-teacher continuum. Um, there are librarian continuum evaluations um, and we would love for that to be the lens that we are seeing through rather than um, the teacher's evaluation continuum. So other than that, uh, we're open for questions and thank you so much for your time tonight. I really appreciate you all and the support that you've given us. Thank you. Just in case you don't know who I am, I am Melissa Goodwin and I am at the Intermediate School. Do you have any questions? Well, yes. as I do, you mentioned wanting to be evaluated on a librarian continuum instead of a teacher, and that makes perfect sense. Do you have examples? Um, Tish has been working on one. Um, I think she started it a few years ago. Basically, it looks very similar to the teacher one and has still the teacher elements, but it also includes some of the library elements, like um, uh, kind of just are we how are we utilizing technology and are uh, just like the book selection that we choose and are we managing our money uh, things like that so just a, a little bit more what's that software that she talked about earlier? we video yeah, yeah um i have used it a little bit <laughs> uh, the I'm not exactly sure what the middle school and high school does do with it. Um, okay. I used it to create uh, book I me mean, reading books during um, the COVID times and just putting the pictures up there. I know that they do so much more with that, and I am so sorry yeah, that you're all good. But we have it. we have access to it currently. Yes, right. yes, the middle school and high school does, yes. Mm -hmm. But it is something I think that is a little more expensive. And um, if, just with books getting more expensive and things like that, if we were have, going to have to cut something, I think we would have to cut the lead video. Um, but it is something that we don't want to see go away. Part of the plan is having I think that I think we kind of decided maybe to do Long County one author either like every other year or maybe every third year. We are going to try something new. We're going to try um, it's called March Mammal Madness. It's put on by the University of Arizona, and it's kind of similar to the basketball things. The kids fill out a um, a bracket, and then there are they have battles. Right now, um, the Versus books, they're they're animal, animal battles like hornet wasp versus scorpion, like who would win? And the kids are really big on that. And there is a lot of like the kids will research about the animals before they do their uh, brackets. And then also just because with the one county one author, we our goal. I feel like our goal didn't quite happen, at least at our district, because each building read a different book, and we wanted more to be able to, for families to be able to come together with something. And so if they had a kid in a different building, they were reading four different books. And so we're going to try to do something that everyone can come together on. So, and the University of Arizona has different they have different levels of research and stuff for it so they can they've kind of done our groundwork but um i've heard about it at different um the library conference that i went to last spring and several really good um schools said or schools said they had a really good participation so we're already hearing about that Thank you. You're welcome. Good job.
Extra and co-curricular activities. I'm like playing new guy stuff every, you know, not much longer, so I'm sorry, but those do <laughs> not have in time to get into the packet. So um, you can kind of just take a look at those while I'm, I'm talking if you'd like to. Uh, we just wrapped up last week what I think was an amazing fall. Uh, well win for me coming in uh, to a new situation, uh, but absolutely loved uh, every part of it. I think our kids get a, a lot of opportunities, and I think it's, uh, they, they do love different things. And we have many kids who are involved in athletics, involved in activities as well. And uh, I think uh, we provide a lot of different experiences for those kids. In uh, the fall athletics, I just wanted to point out some of the highlights. Uh, our cheerleaders qualified for the uh, state meet. They will be competing uh, that on the 10th of December. Our football was a district runner up. Girls tennis were the district champions. And we had a doubles team go state, we play sixth. Our girls golf, um, we had uh, three girls go to the state meet. Volleyball uh, went to the district semifinals. Our girls got country team, all played for state, and two boys from the, the, uh, the boys team as well. We had 237 total athletes at the high school level this year. Uh, and the fall, and we had 32 all conference athletes and 14 all district athletes. Um, we had our two teams qualified for state, uh, except for four, and then we had five individuals as well. So, to me, overall, a, a great um, fall for our kids, and uh, again, it was a great opportunity for those kids uh, to do those activities. If you have any questions on that fall wrap up, I, I will give you a little preview as well as to things that are coming up. I do want to mention activities real quick. You guys heard a little bit about the choir uh, when Mike was reading out those. Um, we also had our fall play, um, which was uh, an amazing uh, production as well. And the set was, was great, it was really cool. Uh, our speech and debate team is competing almost every weekend and doing very well. Our band was in two marching competitions this fall. And uh, I think you know, those kids are doing a great job there as well. Very excited for them. The uh, basketball, wrestling, and swim seasons are well underway now. Uh, we'll start competitions next week. The girls are going to the Fair Play Tournament, the girls basketball team. The boys will play after Thanksgiving at the Lillard Tournament. Wrestling will have their home meets uh, the first weekend of December. Which will be, now it's going to be a, um, the JV and the girls will be on Friday night, and the boys will be on holiday Saturday. Instead of being a dual tournament, it's an individual tournament. So um, pretty excited to see that, and then uh, we'll just be rolling after that. The swim starts that next week as well, so right after break. Numbers there, if you uh, are interested in that, boys have 39 out for basketball, the girls have 28. We have 42 boys wrestlers and eight girl wrestlers and 16 swimmers. So, and those numbers, I looked at the numbers from last year, those are up quite a bit actually. Mm -hmm. Some of those sports especially, wrestling is one of them. Swimming. Um, <laughs> so. Questions that you guys have? Um, I'm just continuing in, in the new role in evaluating our programs and just seeing, you know, where are we at, where do we want to be, and how are we going to get there. Started that process by meeting with the coaches in June, the head coaches, and then uh, following up with those evaluations for the fall. And we're just about to get those uh, wrapped up here before the next meeting. And then, uh, as I said, we'll be in we'll winter and, and rolling. Any questions that you guys have? All right, awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Can I go to the choir concert? Absolutely. I'll start. Alrighty, so I just want to touch on a couple of things that aren't in the board report. Um, one, um, kind of just Building off what Pizzetti was saying, sports are underway. We've had our, our student athletes for the last three and a half weeks have been preparing for um, competition, and uh, girls basketball and wrestling started this week, um, and then boys will start after Thanksgiving. So I think it's going to be very competitive, very successful. Um, what I saw at wrestling a couple nights ago, um, a duel against Buffalo and, and Reed Spring, it looked really good. So super excited. I think it's going to be a really good season. Um, and then another thing uh, I thought would be really neat to share with you. Um, a few weeks ago, I 
sent out to all of our students um, a video that I made describing um, this idea that I had with the Google form and it was some BMS shout outs. So they had a drop down box so they can pick any staff member uh, that they see at BMS and then write a little shout out to them. You know what they're thankful for, you know, their favorite teacher, whatever. Um, so I just want to share with you a couple of things. <clears throat> we got probably 200 responses from it and I don't know what I'm going to do with those yet. Maybe save them for a rainy day, give them to the teachers. <laughs> Um, you know, second the second semester can kind of be a grind, so maybe give them some encouragement then, or maybe a Christmas gift, I don't know. But um, I'm going to share with you a couple that our students um, wrote about their teachers just to show you how thoughtful and awesome our students are, but to show you, like, the fruit that our, our, our teachers, from our teachers, just creating great relationships with our students. So to Mrs. Ali, a teacher, or a student wrote, she is one of the greatest teachers in the world. She is sweet, kind, and very likable. I can't imagine not having her as a teacher. She makes my day, and I hope I make hers. But oh, that was sweet. Um, to our food service ladies, I want to shout out to our lunch ladies. They are always super friendly and forgiving when you don't speak loud enough for them to hear you. And even though we don't see them for very long each day, they're still amazing and are just as great as any of our core teachers. Oh, that was really thoughtful. Um, this is to Coach Coleman, our weights teacher. Uh, he said, you have changed, or a student said, you have changed my life for the better. I used to be weak and made fun of, but then I came into weights and my whole world changed. I became healthier and just a better person mentally and physically. So I thought that was awesome. And one more, uh, Mr. C, seventh grade social studies. Uh, this student said, he's always encouraging, even when I <clears throat> feel like I can't do it. He always tells me to be more confident in everything that I do, which I appreciate since I'm afraid to get anything wrong. Then he's also the funniest and bestest teacher. And then in parentheses, they said, I know this isn't proper grammar. I only do this on special occasions. <laughs> <laughs> really thoughtful and kind, and I can't wait to give those to our teachers. They're, I think they're going to be very, um, they'll fill their cup. So, any questions for me? Thank you, guys. Mr. Uh, Bullard. Good evening. Um, yeah, start out with a, a few shout outs from me. Uh, a couple things mentioned in the board report. One, if you don't know, for all buildings, cafeteria staff today and yesterday was taxing with the Thanksgiving dinners, and they are awesome. Um, so, big shout out to them because the kids really enjoy those. Uh, I do, and I know we did commendations, but Polk County Library, awesome. They called, they showed up for lunch shifts and just brought in boxes of really nice hardback books and just wanted to give them out to the kids. Said, hey, we got these. We want to do some community outreach stuff. And cool deal. Just set up a table and, and handed them out and a good deal there. And then I do on our Veterans Day, because again, when, when I wrote this, we hadn't had the Veterans Day yet, so didn't want to brag on it too much. However, <laughs> uh, now that we've had it, uh, they did an absolutely, at least in my opinion, fantastic job. Uh, student Council organized that, so big shout out to all those kids and sponsors. Um, gosh, I don't know, we had 100 plus veterans probably in for breakfast, which our cafeteria staff did a lot of that. Our um, culinary department made the cinnamon rolls. Our Interact Club helped, um, you know, seat veterans and serve and do all those things. So it was really, really a nice, nice deal so I want to give a shout out. Um, a couple other just little mentions. Uh, December 6th I've got for the concert. That may be a change on the calendar. Uh, Mr. True just told me that so I don't want to give you bad information so we'll actually we'll, we'll get some um, information out on that if that does end up changing. Uh, there's a conflict there on that date. And uh, again highlight the, the 9th and 10th I put the debate tournament and make sure you know that is a home debate debate tournament, which is pretty cool to be hosting something like that. I talked with Ethan today, and I think he said at this point they have 15 or 16 schools signed up, which is makes for a very huge debate tournament. I know he's stressing just the sheer amount of judges and, and protocol and rooms and things you need for that. Um, so if you guys get a chance to stop by again, that's that's the home debate. Um, and then really just lastly, not a bit, but to kind of update you, um, we've been looking at, at what we want to do with our technical offerings as far as staying with OTC, Dallas County Career Center. We've looked, we've weighed that. 
Uh, I think for next year, we're going to stay with OTC, um, just based on the number of offerings and what our kids have put down on interest surveys and based on enrollment this year. Um, I think that's something in the spring we probably need to reevaluate as far as, okay, what's, is that our long, long term, which may be, uh, but uh, again, evaluate that on a long-term basis on what we need to do. Uh, but did want to give you just a quick update that we'll be planning on going back to OTC for the next school year. So, any questions for me? I had a speech student reach out to me about judging at the speech tournament. I'm out of town that weekend, but she did ask if I would convey to the rest of the board if anyone else would like to be a judge. Absolutely. I know each of the students have to get so many judges. I believe I have signed up for three different judging okay. sessions because well, can't say no. It's the 9th and 10th of December, mm -hmm. correct? Yes. Yeah. And if you'd be interested, you certainly shoot me an email or, or Mr. Samuel. Uh, but there's three or four time slots on the 9th. Then they need judges anywhere from 3.30 to 8.15 to 9 o'clock at night. And then Saturday from about 8 or 9 in the morning till 1 or 2 in the afternoon, so if you're a I signed up for the early, I signed up for the early session. Uh, but yeah, that, thank you, Paula. Yeah, absolutely. If you've not ever done that, it, it's impressive. Yep, it is. Agreed. All right, thank you. Thank you. Shelly? Okay, so I did something a little bit different with my board report. Um, so the first little paragraph you see about the, um, the growth in students, I actually asked the, the teachers, I said, what would you like the board to know about this building or your classrooms? And it was kind of, it was, I was a little bit like Ben. I had a, a moment where I was just sitting there reading the text. Um, so they were excited. Um, so I put in here what they said. So they were talking about the growth of the students. I also want to talk about my teachers because they, um, you hear that in the hallway, that excitement, and they're all the time talking about how their students are growing. Um, so it's not just what they conveyed to me, and um, the texts were really, really a, a good conversation because it happened, you know, it was interactive with everyone. But also just, um, I do hear it in the hall. And so they're really proud of their students. They're proud of what they're doing. Um, and I think that goes to, to the last, or the part about the curriculum. And I know I've talked about it nearly every time, but we started without a formal curriculum, we're really dissecting that. And the work that they have done, they're all in on that. Um, we have 19 posters on our PL day that we have, by each chapter, we've taken each um, unit in our math and we've shown under each one of our standards where that math unit teaches. So we've dissected it and said, okay, in the standards, we see that taught 20 times. And so in on the PL day, you know, we don't have we enough days in the year to accommodate that resource. So we're going to pare down so that we have the number of days much as the number of lessons. And so we know when we get to a standard that has 20, we don't want to spend 20 lessons on this standard and only one or two over here. We want to make sure we get the one or two over here and maybe less on this side. So we're going to pare that down. Um, I would invite you in to see that because they are very engaged in that process and they're really starting to feel confident with their math resources. That was one of the things that when I first came here, um, you know, that was new to them. It was COVID year. And they're like, man, we just don't feel confident with this. So I think that's shifting, and I would like for you to see the work. So on, on the PL day, we're going to do it in the afternoon. So if you want to stop by to see what that looks like, you're welcome. Um, but just a lot of growth, and I see it in my teachers, and I see it in the students for sure. Um, the other thing I want to just highlight is that we did get the grant for the ECLC um, building. So we got 20000 or 21000 for the Little Liberators, and we got 50000 for ECLC, so a total of 70000 um, So the packages have started coming in, <laughs> so that's fun. Um, the excitement of the hallway was um, quite entertaining. I think we'll be entertained between now and Christmas. Um, because each time we bring a new resource into the building, the kids are audibly excited. Um, so we'll get to do a lot of things. It completely sets up the new daycare class as well as Mrs. Watley's class. And so she'll have all of them, anything from bookshelves to tables to all the instructional resources. So we just went through all the other classes and said, okay, what areas do we teach in and then what supplies you need? And so we wrote the grant to match those things. 
and then that'll cover um, three months of their salary and benefits. And then um, we'll also we put some playground stuff. We're looking at maybe putting some shade out there because it gets pretty hot. Um, so you're gonna see some new things over at ECLC. Um, Brayden's gonna do a video when it all comes in. I I posted last night some pictures of the, the first shipment. He's like, hey, I want to come over. And I'm like, oh, wait, <laughs> there's going to be a lot more. Mm -hmm. So um, be looking for that. I think it'll probably take us between now and December to start getting that stuff in. So in January, we're going to put together a video because that came from the Department of Education. And so I'd like for you to see what that looks like. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you. I love school because we give so many experiences to kids, right? So Jason mentioned the Thanksgiving lunch. It, of course, our workers outdid themselves. It was fabulous. But the best part is to answer questions from kids like, what's this? It's stuffing. What, what's on top of the green beans? Ooh, you've got to try those. Those are French fried onions. You know, we just give so many experiences to kids that are beyond just what they learn from books. So. Huge shout out again to our kitchen staff. They made the Thanksgiving lunch awesome. Um, we had a wonderful family night. We are doing family nights by grade level this year, just integrating everything into it. So we had a hopping good time. It was a popcorn theme. So it was math, reading. Um, Bolt County Library was also there and gave a book to every family. And then our library also gave a book to every family. We, don't, we have two, just under 200 first graders, but we had over 291 people there. So it wasn't all of our first graders, but the whole family came. We had lots of grandmas and grandpas in wheelchairs, walkers, I mean, it was a family event. So that was really exciting to see. Um, we have restructured our morning routine a little bit, and we are working intentionally with kids to greet each other in the mornings. So they have to there's a greeter, they wear an apron, they go up to other students and they say, what morning greeting would you like? So we're practicing looking, making eye contact, and they hug or fist bump, high five, something like that. Um, and so this time of year, kids are writing thinking notes everywhere. Of course, that's what teachers are writing, but they're or working on them in classrooms, but they're writing lots of letters to people who greeted them. I'm thankful for you because you greeted me this morning. And um, so we're really working on a lot of those social emotional skills just everywhere throughout the child's day. Um, the last thing I want to say is also very grateful that Career Ladder has come back on the scene. Uh, we have lots of kids who are being tutored in academics. We also have children who teachers have started pulling care groups. So in the morning they get there at 7 15. What are they doing? Well, we're kind of waiting. We're just sitting. We have teachers who are now coming to the pool and groups of kids and are playing things like memory with kids and they're shocked at, oh, we have these kids who cannot play memory. We got to play it with them. We got to teach them. They're playing hi-ho cheerio, just practicing taking turns. Um, so lots of pouring into our kids in that way as well. Those are just some of the things happening with the primary. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Um, some some fun things that have happened. Uh, this had this was November tenth last Thursday. Is that right, Braden? Braden was there. Yes. Our Special Olympics bowling team competed down at Sunshine Lanes in Springfield. Um, we get some other area schools. I think Stockton is there. Ozark, uh, Purdy, maybe one other. I'm not, I don't remember. But we had uh, eighteen medalists out of that group. I don't have the breakdown of gold, bronze, silver, any of that, but we had multiple students that got gold medals in their division, so that was fun to watch. I have to go down there for a little bit and see them compete and just enjoy the, you know, they love competing, but there's some camaraderie that goes on. There are students that they've competed against before, so they know them a little bit. There's a friendship there. It's not it's not a necessarily a rivalry or anything like we see in other sports and things that we attend, so uh, just really fun just to see them grow through the different activities that they do. They'll be getting ready to start their Special Olympics basketball season, so uh, I don't believe they'll have any uh, 
games or tournaments or anything until later on January, February, maybe. So there'll be a lot of practices and just be ready for that. Um, as far as the, the special ed side goes, one thing, you know, we're, we're close to Thanksgiving here. I'm real thankful for just the, the SPED team that I get to work with. We have teachers that have really worked hard, uh, parents that have really worked hard, and we made some changes for this year, and they've taken on those changes and really rolled with it. And one of the biggest ones, of course, is just the SPED track moving over to our different software. Uh, that's a big undertaking as far as paperwork goes. So they got to learn a new system, but they got to get things transferred over from the other system before it's uh, not in use anymore. So. That's been a big deal, but they enjoyed the change because I really believe that they believe that it's become more efficient and it's a better use of what they can do with their time. Uh, they're still focused on the, the teaching part of what they do. They haven't lost that. And that's one of the things that I'm thankful for is that their focus still remains on the students. We talk a lot about paper, it's important, but their focus is always on their students and the growth that they can achieve through those interactions, working with other students and the things that they plan for. So um, as we move forward, a couple big things that are coming our way. We just got correspondence from Desi about two weeks ago on our tiered monitoring. We're in cohort three. So that means we are in line for a on-site review. Doesn't mean that it's gonna happen, but that, that this would be the year that it would happen if they chose us for that. Uh, we'll be kind of collecting files and going through those uh, for a, a period of time here. Our first deadline isn't until February, but it'll hit us quick. We wanna make sure that we're on that. Uh, the other one that's coming up is our December 1st child count for core data. So we'll be working with, uh, of course, with Mr. Garber on that and then just making sure that we have accurate numbers. We're pulling from a different system now. So with, with SpedTrack, we gotta make sure that we've got everything right. And it's important as we move through those things. So uh, one thing that you see on the board report, the grant that the DHS Special Ed Education Department got of over $15,000 from Senate Bill 40 for a driving simulator. Um, one thing that we didn't necessarily plan to have happen, but it's just kind of manifested through uh, a natural way because of career ladder. They're going to be able to incorporate that into some of their career ladder plans, uh, getting students over there to work on some of the driving skills that they may not get the opportunity to do either during school or ever. I mean, it, they just may not have that opportunity for you know, if they don't have access to a vehicle, if it's something that's not necessarily. We have a lot of kids that they get to that age of 15, 16, and they're not even interested in driving, which is fine, but this is at least a way where you can generate that interest and show them some of those key skills as they do prepare for at some point that skill as an independent adult so big focus for us is always on just that post-secondary side of what's going to be happening with students and that's one of those things that we've never really been able to incorporate uh, aside from what happens over the summer with driver's ed so this will be a way to just kind of get a few more students into that uh, that area of, uh, of just the, an independent living skill that they hopefully can develop in a, in a strong way and just kind of need to have. So um, that's, that's all I have. Any questions? Thank you. I have a few highlights to share. I plan to go pretty quickly. If I, uh, if you need to interrupt me and ask a question. Please, please be comfortable and do that. Two weeks ago, we finalized our ARPA application for the Workforce Training Grant. Uh, Dr. Asville and, and Chelsea were incredibly helpful gathering that information. With our 25% match, this grant would be two and a half million infused into our district uh, to offer workforce training to current education, uh, career education students and adult learners in our area, especially to households affected by the slow economy. We would offer basic career development skills, hands-on job training, and specific skill training in the area of agriculture, auto mechanics, culinary arts, business, and manufacturing. We plan to do this uh, in cycles uh, for four years, so two and a half million. If we get a hit, we'll know December 2nd really hoping for the best. I'm also very happy to report that yesterday we received word we were approved for the ECF grant for a uh, 300 Chromebooks, a little over 100,000. 
uh, that is very welcome news. Our district could use 100 Chromebooks right now. We plan to hold the other 200 in reserve and for the incoming students and give some um, budget relief. So that's our plan for the Chromebooks. It's very welcome news. That took a long time to get that answer. Um, we're kind of looking at ourselves at a, as a department. We're focusing on areas over the next 12 months to serve our district better, um, areas like being helpful, being efficient, being responsive. We're looking hard at those and how we can be better as a department. And we are hopeful that in the next 12 months, the district will see some positive changes in, um, in the tech department. We continue to address our doors and cameras. We're looking strategically at systems, at equipment, at placement, at vendors. And we've accomplished a lot in the last few months, but we still have a few specific areas to address. Energy management. We are looking at a Department of Natural Resource grant that would potentially fund an energy audit of our lighting, electric, and utility uses. The cost of the audit would be offset by this grant. It would serve as a blueprint for ways to focus on things we need and the savings they would bring to the district. We uh, insurance claim. We've worked together with roofing companies and have completed a review of the hail damage related to our HVAC, our awnings, and stucco damage at the annex. We have identified a vendor we would possibly like to work with, and they would manage all of these projects and also the insurance claim process. So we have to work out for that. Subscriptions especially the tech subscriptions. There are a lot of moving parts in tech. We have a lot of different types of subscriptions. We are reviewing all of them, no exceptions, and see if something could be safely dropped or re-engineered or combined with something else. And we're doing this very carefully but thoroughly. So that we're doing that with our subscriptions. And um, we have, uh, we've addressed the intercom system at the Bolivar Primary School. We have worked closely with a very helpful vendor on the intercom system at Bolivar Primary School. They have fixed an outside speaker. They work parts for another outside speaker and parts to install an intercom in one of the rooms. Uh, lastly, I think it's worth noting that I was the undisputed champion of the costume contest. <laughs> I'm surprised that it hasn't come up in, 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 a, in a report. So I just wanted to get that. We discussed it in closed session. Close session. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We, we felt that was a very high level personnel item and we wanted to make sure. You... That concludes my report. I'm happy to take your questions. And your first question, Luigi. You yeah. dressed up as Luigi. That's the answer to your first question. <laughs> happy Thanksgiving, everybody. You too. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Just, I don't have time because. We're going to talk about TC in a minute. Um, the coaches, instructional coaches, and I have been going to an assessment coaching summit in Ozark. Excellent training. It's six days. They're really talking about as formative and summative assessment and giving us practical things that we can take back and, and, and share with teachers about questioning techniques, students talking and learning deeper together. Some really good instructional pieces today. I think we're all appreciating um, the opportunity to go to the summit. Um, schools from around Southwest Missouri are also there as well, so that, the collaboration is good as well. Um, guiding Coalition Zoom call with Eric Rodell. Those happened this week at the middle school and last week across the district. So, so good. He's been such a good consultant for us, and he really is pushing our thinking in every building. And yeah, that's what we need him to do, is come in and say, what about this? What about this? And guys, is he doing that for us? He definitely is doing that. And um, he's, he's easy to listen to, but He's on it like we on it, and we're thankful for that. And so we are moving forward with um, Eric Fidel. He's, he's doing a great job. Um, tiered monitoring for federal programs. That is this year. We've already completed our October cycle. December cycle has been opened up. And so we will have until mid-December to submit paperwork. It's really a desk audit. They just want evidence of our best practice. And so it's a lot of paper upload for Title IA, Title IIA, Title IA. And um, we'll be doing that throughout the month of December. Um, EOC training for November. We will be giving the EOC test at the high school December 12th through the 16th. We're doing a training on November 28th, and that's really primarily government and then some of the EOC 
a test for algebra one that Betty was speaking with us about for those teacher those students that need that A plus. And then we've got some students at Bridges that are taking the high sit and graduating early. Um, I have to say, Darren Ankrum is doing an amazing job of getting those students graduated. It's it's a celebration, and he invites us over to celebrate when it happens. So so we're excited about that. But we've got some of those kiddos that will go ahead and take their their EOCs, and then. Um, PLC work. I just want to compliment our leadership team. Um, building principals have done a great job of pulling together effective dining coalitions in those buildings, and um, we're really moving that work forward. And so my hats are off to our leadership team, our principals, and those teachers that are guiding that work. They're doing a great job. Mm -hmm. That's all I have. Dr. Astro. So a couple things that I wanted to give you some. FYI, uh, yesterday BOMO Works presented some apprenticeship uh, awards, uh, certificates, and we had some people down from DESE for that. Um, really appreciate uh, Betty's work on that. And I know she already left but, uh, for her A-plus report, but um, BOMO Works is a great program. Her emphasis that she talked about in A-plus in regard to, there are so many wonderful pathways that don't necessarily always take a four-year degree and the emphasis for us in our demographic is how can we reach those particular students? The apprenticeship piece that she has developed and she's working with is just really great. And it's a good model for a lot of school districts. So uh, a lot of good shout out for her for what she's doing there. And, and congratulations to our students. And by the way, we had three education apprenticeships. And so those are students that are our students working for us in a paid apprenticeship and uh, so that's that's kind of a neat grow your own part of that. And I think she said that we may have a couple more second semester that have now been in that uh, grow your own class and maybe are like, hey, I, I think I might want to participate in that. So that's a good thing. Um, as a school district, we have certain background and uh, check uh, requirements uh, that um, uh, requires certain state highway patrol fingerprint background checking and family registered background checking. Usually the fingerprints uh, for volunteers, substitutes, those type of things, we can usually get the fingerprint back in about 24 hours, uh, sometimes a little longer. But the family registry checklist is, is two weeks to three weeks behind right now. That is out completely out of our control. So for any of our buildings and people that are thinking about volunteering or wanting to gain access to certain events, they need to realize that it, it, that process could take up to three weeks, and not, not because we don't have our part done, but it, it could take three weeks to get back those required components. Along with that, we just completed our Missouri Highway Patrol background check audit. Uh, Jody Burke facilitated, uh, facilitates that. She's um, what they call our, our lasso coordinator on the background check. She did an excellent job. Uh, we were found in compliance. Uh, we have uh, some additional training now that we get to take part in, but uh, we just got that report today. We did the, the audit yesterday. She did a great job. So, um, and there's there's a, a, a lot of areas that they have to kind of ask questions and we have to submit information to. And um, there's a random checks of certain names and those names may not have applied to us but you know we that they're like where is this person and so she has to check and find those things so it was really good so we're pretty proud of that um wanted to also kind of follow up it's it's tied to our csip but i thought this would be a good time to mention it so one of our csip findings was hey how can we provide additional information from the central office in regard to district operations to building level. And so uh, one of the things we're doing was, is the email follow-up from board uh, meetings the day after. We're, we're providing some district update things. What we're gonna try to do is we're gonna try to do those out, out building uh, on Wednesdays. We're just gonna try to select a day. And if, you know, if, if someone has 30 minutes, we're gonna just, if they're there, if there's two people there, if there's 20 people there, we're going to try to offer up some just general discussion, do some question answers. We're going to try to have three specific topics that we're going to present about just really quick and then open it up to questions that it may be about what about our district, <clears throat> our district finances? What about uh, capital project planning? What, what about health insurance? Because we're doing some things with health insurance right now. So really trying to connect more than just an email. 
providing a you know an in person kind of an opportunity for people to say, hey, I, I've heard, or I want to know, or is this actually occurring? And, and getting those opportunities just to say, hey, here I am. What do you need to know? And, and TC and I will be doing some of those. And those will start right when we get back from Thanksgiving break. We know that everybody's busy, so these are not scheduled for like hour long powered meetings. We're just going to do kind of a, you know, hey, coffee, tea, and me kind of thing, you know, and we'll just present some opportunities for people to come and go if they want. If they've got a specific question, they can email me that, and uh, we'll give everybody the location. And uh, we may start at the primary, but anybody's welcome. Or we may have it at the high school, and we'll, we'll just pick, you know, go to the library, and if anybody wants to show up, they can. And again, if we have one person or 35 people, it's just an opportunity to provide information about the district and some of the things that are occurring uh, in the operations piece. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Can you give us a list of what those are? So no, I'm sorry, I won't be able to do that. I'm sorry. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> <laughs> but that way, if yeah, November, any of us have questions yeah, or whatever. Yeah, uh, November 30th is going to be the first one. Is that uh -huh. um, I haven't picked the location yet because I haven't asked the principals what's going on and who, who wants to host the first one. So, okay, let us know so we can yep. direct anyone else there that had questions for us. All right, um, so you got Dr. Asmo? Mm -hmm. Okay, so moving on to board governance, we are going to um, kind of shoot our own horn a little bit this month, and we have. Uh, our board has attended several different functions recently and been working really hard to help our teachers, help our students, help become a better board. Um, one of the things that we did was uh, MSBA had their annual conference in Kansas City and ahead of that they had the Midwest Safety Summit and Paula and I were fortunate to go to that as well as Dr. Garber and I just I can't say enough good things about it and all the things that we learned Michelle Gay who lost a child in Sandy Hook and then Frank DeAngelis who was the principal at Columbine were the two keynote speakers and we just we got to meet some really interesting people but we also learned about a lot of things that maybe that we're not quite ready for here and also that was the same timing as when the Hillcrest got the the SWAT, whatever, that thing that happened at Hillcrest that Thursday. So all of that was happening at once. And then Friday and Saturday, um, Dr. Wall, Dr. Asbill, Mike Ryan, Jarrah, Brandon, we were all up there to go to um, several sessions. And so we're just kind of going to kind of each share out about those. And so I will start the session that I, one of the ones I was most excited about was about having a student advisor on the school board. And that would be a high school student. and. We are hoping Mr. Blair to get that started soon and figure out what that's going to look like for us as a board and then start that process with, you know, students at your building. And we would, one person would be chosen, they would attend our monthly board meetings, they, they wouldn't be a voting member of the board obviously, but they would come and give input. And we learned a lot at our conference about how important it is to hear from your students. I mean, we spend a lot of time talking to the adults in the building, but not nearly enough time talking to the students, um, especially, you know, the older they get, they, I mean, they have some really smart kiddos with some really great ideas. And so, you know, we need, we need to pick their brains and listen to them. So we're excited about implementing that. Um, Mike Ryan is not here to share out. Jara, I'll go with you next. Okay. Um, well, first of all, I want to give a shout out to our librarians. So several of us attended, they did a session that was featured and they did a phenomenal job. So yes. definitely appreciated that because I know that was a lot of work. Um, and then secondly, I attended a session that was a program that, I can't remember what school is doing it, but anyway, it was close by here. And it's where they allow um, a set number of community members to come into the district. It's like a seven week course in the evening for like seven nights and they learn like visit all the properties that the district has they see different pieces of programs and things like that they spend some time learning about um, like what it means to be a board member they different hear from different teachers from different admin they learn about finance but it's a really like an outreach to the community and the 
benefits that they talked about were phenomenal. So, you know, a lot of teachers participate. So it was an opportunity for like kind of teachers to almost cross train a little bit on what's happening in other buildings. Um, and it was an opportunity for like kind of misconceptions. So, you know, different things like one guy talked about, uh, they had had some opposition to a tax levy. And so they had these 15 people come in and see the building where the students were meeting and they were like, oh my gosh, like we had no idea. And then they kind of went out and, and talked about those things. So it was just a lot of opportunity for the district to talk about what, um, like why things happen the way that they do in schools. Because a lot of times people say like, well, the school's not doing anything about this. Well, there's probably a reason why they're not, well, you know, none of us, none of you are intentionally not doing something, um, same, same as us. So it was just an opportunity to kind of educate back and forth. And then, and he said also from the, the district perspective, it was an opportunity to understand and be able to communicate out better to the, you know, to the community or whatever, to the constituents, families and such. So I hope it's a program that we can implement here. I know Dr. Wall, I think, had, you know, talked about um, possibly setting that up. It's a time commitment. Um, I realize that, but, you know, even as a board member, like, some of the things that they got to do, like, I've, I've not gotten to do those things, you know, to hear those things or whatever. So I think it would be a really, really good um, opportunity. They limit it to, like, 15 people. They feed everyone, so that, you know, makes it a little bit more easy to attend. Um, they said that they actually had a few, like, I would say, like, the fifth grade students that attended with parents because of child care issues and that was completely fine that kind of added an extra layer um there were just a lot of good benefits and so i hope it's a program that we can implement here at Oliver. i believe that's neosha neosha thank you it's close by i think it's purple <laughs> brandon yeah i went to some interesting class and first i want to second what jared said and mike mentioned in combination our librarians were impressive and they they just represent the school really well. We go to a lot of these classes and getting to see them there. They were so professional, it's great. Uh, the class I was gonna talk about though, I went to one, it was mental health in rural schools. And when I went there, what it actually is, is a research project from MU and it gives schools, well, their, their primary focus is on improving rural schools capacity uh, to support students with the emotional, social emotional well-being. Um, they're providing tools, providing data, and then eventually even providing some interventions uh, to help to help kids that we know right now are struggling with mental health issues. So I think we're taking some steps to look into that and see if we will we'll be a fit for the program. But I think so far it's looking pretty good. Absolutely. But I, I was pretty excited to see if we get our school involved to, to help some more kids out. So far we've done a Zoom with. Um, the researcher at the University of Missouri kind of found out where it was funded. It's funded through the Department of Education, mm -hmm. and um, Dr. Garber has taken it to the counseling staff. They're interested in Zooming with her. So they're going to get that scheduled and learn a little bit more about it, but they're excited and feel like it's got some potential for sure. I think it would be great. Paul? Um, most of the sessions that I attended at uh, MSBA had to do with legislative updates and, and school budgeting, and those are strong areas of interest for me and for the district and um, they're generally depressing um, <laughs> but um, one thing that I did come away with was just how important it is for all of us to tell our school story to everybody we know and teachers need to tell the story the good stuff that happens and and um, we absolutely have to continue to do that and we have to tell our legislators how important public education is and um, if, if you're not watching what's happening in the state of Missouri in about three years, we're going to have a real problem with funding, not just schools, but everything. Mm -hmm. And so we, we as a district have got to be ready for that. And so that for me, and, and every time I attend one of these, the, the call gets a little bit more urgent. Um, we, we've got to make sure our district is in strong financial shape. And so um, I think that's something that we're, we're all as a board very aware of, and we're going to continue to to pay a lot of attention to that. Um, and to uh, second what Carrie said, 
uh, attending the safety summit. This was the first Midwest safety summit. It wasn't just Missouri, but schools from all or all across the middle of the United States, the East Coast, and so really it was kind of a national safety summit. Uh, the quality of the uh, speakers we had was out of this world. And um, they've come away with uh, really some good national models of understanding what school safety really is and what it's not. And it's not just preparing for someone with a gun to walk through the door, but there's six very distinct areas of school safety that go into creating a, a comprehensive preparedness plan and an awareness of, uh, of safety. Um, the, one of the things that really stuck out to me, uh, Michelle Gay, as uh, Carrie mentioned, lost her six-year-old child at Sandy Hook, and she talked about how um, the, the gunman, um, when his body was autopsied, weighed 97 pounds. He was over six feet tall. And so not only was he mentally ill, he was physically ill. And, and there are just so many other components that got missed long before he came through the door. And, and how we just have to pull together our entire community and not just wait for somebody to do something violent. And the significance of teachers interacting with students, my goodness, uh, that was the absolute takeaway. It, it, that's, that's the key right there is relationships, making sure we have relationships with our students. And that's the common component. So those kids who have uh, violent iterations is the lack of connection. And we see that common theme through that. So yeah, we, we all have the opportunity to make a difference. And I, you just can't say enough about our teachers um, and the difference that they make. So was was very eye-opening and I think it's going to be very beneficial for uh, our district. Missouri has taken a huge leadership role in school safety across the country and I'm so proud to be part of the Missouri School Boards Association has also taken a huge a national leadership role in, in school safety so we're going to make sure that the Bolivar is absolute part of that so I'm looking forward to that. Dr. Anthony, Dr. Wall, either of you have anything you wanted to share from your time? I, I have some, but it's going to be up and kind of follows up on the fiscal and the Blue Ribbon Commission. Okay. So. All right, Dr. Wall, would you have anything to share? One thing I really, I went to a lot of great sessions, um, definitely did. One thing I really enjoyed was going to the galley of students that were there. Oh my goodness. So impressive, just visiting with them, engaging them, talking to them about their programs and what they're doing. You guys are really bright young people. Um, so if you ever get discouraged about what the future looks like, walk down that alley and you're gonna be encouraged again because it was fun to see just the creativity, the intelligence, the communication skills. And you know, Bolivar kids were represented. Our ag department did a fantastic so job. Good. So it was fun to see and fun to be a part of. Okay, strategic planning, district financial plans. Chelsea, you're up. Okay. Um, so to start, um, JAG was audited beginning in October. Today we had our exit interview and they had no findings. So that's awesome. Um, they did state for us some things to work on is they would like to hear the success stories of the students and then to just make sure that we're doing those follow-up reports with the students. They like to see about 60% of students after graduation are either in a full-time employment or in school full-time. And so if they're not, we like to just make sure to engage with them, try and help them find a job, whether they're living here or somewhere else, find somewhere they can be engaged. So that was awesome to hear. Um, also been looking at kind of our employee absences since the end of school year. Really kind of just hounding in on that right now, um, seeing maybe how we're using our days, um, how often, so we're just looking at that um, as we go towards into the holiday season especially. Um, also, the, we have two grants, well four grants currently, but two of them, the Grow Your Own Grant and the ARP IDA. Um, I submitted for reimbursement for those this week. So that's about 30,000 that we'll get next month. Um, also, we have ARP for homeless children and youth grant. 
and then our teacher retention grant and then once payrolls process tomorrow I'll be able to submit for those as well so we'll get some extra funding in December for that um, also we did a our SDAC claims we have submitted those to MSBA effective Tuesday so quarter two and quarter three so we'll be looking at Medicaid um, reimbursements as well um, currently we use talent ed for um, our applicant pool and our records and then we use frontline for our absences and time clock they're very similar programs and they both can give us the same options so we are up with talent ed effective June 2023 or no 2024 so a whole other year but just looking at our options if we were to decide to switch to frontline and have it all housed in one area so our employees are just going to frontline versus having to do two different systems so just looking at that opportunity and see if that would be useful financially safe because it is frontline can, can be a little bit more expensive but frontline also offers um, proactive hiring um, it's a program that we would be able to post a third grade teacher position and we could search and say who's looking for third grade in the state of Missouri and it will send out a message to all of those individuals that it would be interested in that job because sometimes we're seeing the change of people not really looking for jobs but they're wanting people to look for them and so that would allow that we would send a message and say hey we have this position open so that would give that benefit for us as well um, we also sent out an RFQ for insurance um, on 1110 and so we've spoke to um, a couple insurance companies so far and look to be getting those submitted in December from insurance companies. And then in January, we'll do interviews with those companies and hopefully have a decision in February to you guys as well. Also, um, we finally received all of our credit cards. Um, they had a mishap with the printing machine, so we finally got them. Um, so you'll see in your packet, I attached um, the administrative um, purchasing procedures. That is something that I'm going to be giving to all the administrators that they will have to sign off on when picking up those cards, as well as we will the top copy will be what we'll give to employees when they decide to check out a card, and they will give a copy give have a copy given to them so they have the guidelines when they're using those credit cards. Um, and then my last one is the revenue and expenditure summary. And um, you'll notice that in October, we brought in 2 million in revenues, and then we spent 2.8 in expenditures. Um, our salaries and benefits make up over about 60 to 70% of that expenditure. Um, that's pretty common in the months of like September, October, November, and December to see a deficit of spending just because we don't have as much revenue coming in in those months but then in January of course we'll get start getting tax dollars which will increase that revenue as well so, any questions so we send out an RFQ for insurance providers for insurance bids for bids yep. yeah health insurance right mm -hmm. for employees which is different from the consortium so it's still consortium. It's just four different consortiums. It'd be OSBA, Met, Show Me, and the last one is MEUHP. -E yes. So the, yeah. the important part for Bolivar or any school district is not to be a on its own. We we would not right. be able to afford a self funded trust. There are some districts that have had those for many years, but it takes a significant amount of capital to. Have the savings to pay for those so the consortium is the best option for us in this particular case when we, we visited with uh, a cta there are some questions about um, why how health insurance works maybe that selection process uh, quite frankly we just haven't done a very good job in the central office of answering some of those questions over the last several years in regard to why and how this works so the best way for us to do that is to just demonstrate the process of what that review will look like. That health insurance is not property insurance, and it's not like buying paper. You do, it's not like you go with the, the you're going to get a bid for a hundred dollars a box versus eighty dollars a box. Health insurance, there's a significant amount of money, and the 
the way that some of the insurance companies control that particular system and your claims to premium. And if you're a healthy district, you may have a more competitive advantage. If you're not, then you're very reliant on the consortium of, of the value of the group. Um, so that's the important part of that process. So it's really an assessment as much of the consortium as it is of when you're purchasing. That is correct. You, you really, there, there are, you're going to get a health savings account because of the Affordable Care Act. But in, you know, in ours, we have, we have two health savings accounts, and those are considered what they call high deductible plans. And then the rest are, are PPOs. So some consortiums may say, hey, you have one HSA and, and four PPOs. And one could be a $1,000 deductible, $1,500, or $3,000, just depends. The, those plans uh, will vary a little bit. You know, you may have a $25 copay versus a $30 copay, but it's about the value of the consortium and what else you get by the, those particular groups and saying, okay, we, we, we are then getting these particular services um, and our, our teachers then gain additional access to a, a certain additional uh, voluntary plan. So if they if they want to see something that you know is a, a cancer plan or something that that provides them better choices, those are the things that come second after the health insurance option. Okay. The other piece is retirement, but that's a that's a second that's a third layer of this dessert, if you will. And we have not been offering our employees. Uh, 403B and 457 options, um, which is, uh, and, and really informing them of some other things. And we, we just got to do a better job of allowing our, our all of our staff, classified and certified, uh, access to individuals that can inform them that when they, they take a plan, this is, this is what that plan offers, this is the cost of the plan, do they really need that plan, is it just something that they, you know, they're buying because they, they heard somebody else has one, and and then is it because they meet this particular demographic versus you know, from three years from retirement? And so we're just looking at what those consortiums offer in regard to how they service um, our employees, but the health insurance is the base level of what, what we end up having to provide. And it's allowing us to kind of review what our protocols will be um, with Misty, Jody, and I, because I know we used to do in-person enrollments, but then once COVID hit, we went away from that. And we're kind of talking about when would we have for the enrollment this year. At least having like maybe three nights where we would have in-person where people could come here in the boardroom, ask questions, they could get stuff answered, and be able to <coughs> enroll and not have so much confusion around insurance, because there is confusion, not everyone understands it. So are is CTA going to be involved in hearing about all those plans? Well, we're going to have the proposals and then we'll present them. We've already done an initial uh, kind of a health insurance 101 uh, with uh, two of their CTA representatives. And we'll have uh, an additional conversation with Swab. But uh, yeah, we're they're going to be involved and we'll let them see with full transparency how that works. And uh, we, we think that'll be a good thing for, for everyone. Better understanding. Mm -hmm. Very good. Anything else? Thank you. Thank you. I need to give an update for Tim. We have 119 uh, teachers participating in Career Ladder. So we have eight in stage one, seven in stage two, and 104 in stage three. The current projected cost, if everyone completed their hours, um, would be $221,000 uh, for our, that's 40%, that's our cost. Yes, let me get with Tim because that could very great. Now, you should have gotten the the, uh, the handbook, and then the committee reviews those individual uh, plans. So, uh, 
each teacher could have a different plan. So that I don't I just need to clarify that do you want ever you want to know what everybody's doing or you just like for building like here's kind of okay. what's going yeah. on BPS. Here's how we're doing our GIS. Yep. Yeah. We'll get with uh, Tim and kind of have and him the administrators can just make that part of part of Yep, that's well, fine. You know, yep. To make it yeah. Okay. Letter Okay, you know, this fall we spent a lot of time working on a district CSIP. Um, this is a draft that we'd like to share with you tonight. There are a couple of pieces we're going to share with you the first week of December. We have a preset C, I mean, a C. Right. <laughs> Just rewind it, TC. Rewind you, can it. Do it. you can do it. A CSIP pre planning guide. Um, if you will, which is answering other questions that they, they would like for us to answer. And then there's a response to standards, which is a narrative that tells the story of our district. And Andy and Love, Andy Love and I are working on that. And we're also working on getting um, links from principals because we can link lots of things to it, but we can only have a page per question. So it's going to be tricky in how we illustrate, you know, what our district really looks like to tell that story. That's taking a little bit of time, but you will get to see that as well. But this is the main plan right here. Um, I'm just going to go over a couple of little things. Of course, um, Braden did a nice job of developing the graphic for the front cover. Um, we wanted to be engaging and polished looking, but very professional. Um, but we focused on three areas, leadership, learning, and culture. And um, that's what really arose from all of the community meeting groups that Kyle and Mike were a part of. So second page is just a quick introduction and in our Board of Education. Uh, we interest third page back is the CSIP committee and you will see every um, community member, teacher, student, board member, um, administrator, everyone that was involved in that CSIP writing process is on that page. And then of course the next page has our mission, our vision, and our collective commitments. Interesting piece, we were calling this value statements and Eric Trudell, he's hilarious, he said, I really don't care what y'all value, I want to know what you're committing to. I'm like, good point, good point. We're going to commit to these things, right? Um, not to sound crude, but I really appreciated his, you know, he's very, very um, much going to call us out and say, what is it you are going to commit to do to support students and staff and, and people in the district? So we've changed that to collective commitments. And then the focus areas is going to be on that final page. We have 18 goals embedded within the plan. There's five leadership goals, six teaching and learning goals, and seven collaborative climate and culture goals that are embedded within the plan. And then the first goal, of course, is a leadership goal. This template is used consistently throughout the plan. It's going to have your content area at the top. Then we will have our strategy, our goal, how we're going to measure that goal with performance measures. This right here is going to align directly to the MSIP standards. So that coding in that box is aligned to the MSIP standards and then your action plans or your accountability measures and the people that will be responsible for seeing that group. Really would like for you to take a good look at this. You will notice that there is a board goal in the leadership section. So we want you to definitely look that over and give us suggestions for rec or revisions if you have any. Uh, Dr. Asbo was sharing a leadership goal that he and I both have in this plan. Um, so basically the process, the team develops these goals. This really was birthed out of those community meetings that we had throughout the month of September. And then the admin team came together. We had some culture climate survey results. Those um, definitely informed this process. Once those topics rose to the top, um, we began sitting down and writing goals. Last week, the administrative team got together and reviewed the goals and we revised them once again and we feel like we've got a nice product to take to you. So um, please look this over. We will need to adopt this in December at the December board meeting to have it submitted to DESE by the 30th of the month. Um, look for those other two pieces the first week of December, which will be the narrative piece and then just the pre-planning guide. All three pieces need to be uploaded and sent to DESE and we will be evaluated on those three pieces. I can assure you that we have taken the evaluation document, compared it to our three pieces, and we should. So we, we, we have edited ourselves once to make sure that we're. On December 9th, I get to go to 
um, Springfield. After the NASA meeting, I'll be working with a team of educators from Southwest Missouri to, we, we have six CSIP, pre-CSIP plans and response to standards documents from six districts across Southwest Missouri. And we will be evaluating those and calibrating our own scoring so that when we go out in the, this region of the state, um, we can have some consistent scoring. So you've got a great team that's gonna be evaluating ours. Unfortunately, I won't be on that team. Well, kudos to everyone on our team that did such a good job and put so much work into it because um, there are other schools who um, hired their entire process out. And so it's good to know that we own ours and uh, put in the work. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think the goal when we looked at it was, does this sound like Oliver? And it's for stretch in this plan. It's a five-year plan. And we thought that it did, so we hope you feel the same way. Um, it's a draft. Just know that if we need to come back and add a goal or remove a goal, we can definitely do that. But we'll talk about this more in December. You can email me if you have questions or concerns with any of this. And you'll get those other two pieces soon. Perfect. And it's, it's a live document. So just because we're submitting it, that's that's part of the process. So now we have to implement it. We come back and review it, revise it. It's kind of like the shampoo bottle. Lather, rinse, repeat. It's, we got to keep going back to that and saying, did we, if we didn't reach something, what do we need to do to change that? If we reach something, then we need to stretch and say, okay, yes. what, what needs to change there? A lot of the, the pre-planning guide is going to be talking about how do you know? I mean, when are you reviewing it? How often are you reviewing it? When are you looking at data? When does the board receive data? So a lot of good questions about our process to make sure that we're remaining true to the plan. And, and so that's good. We're also aligning all other district plans to the CSIP. So if we have a technology plan, Mike is gonna go through this document. He's going to align that to the goals that are embedded within the CSIP. All of the uh, title plans, I'm going to go through when I develop those in the spring and align those and code them to our CSIP. Principles, when they do their building action steps, we'll align and code to the CSIP. So there will be a lot of indicators you will see on plans, and that's going to be just that alignment process. Because if this is our document, then we need to align to it and make sure that we're fulfilling what we're saying. Um, I have uh, some some important things. So uh, this has been kind of an interesting week. So we have some good and some bad to discuss with you in, in facilities operations. So a couple challenges. Um, about six years ago, the high school roof had a uh, issue where uh, the roof was compromised. In that repair, uh, it created a, uh, a particular seam. That seam is because of the expansion and contraction of the way the roof is. Uh, created some cracks uh, along the center, which is obviously after a long, hot drought um, has, and then some sudden rains has been exposed as a real problem. So we are working on that particular issue right now. Uh, we, Jeff and I got uh, one of the roofing companies in. They will begin work on Monday. So we were able to, uh, it's, it looks like we're getting a good shot shift in the weather so we're going to take advantage of it students are gone teachers are gone so uh, we hope to have that repair made um, by wednesday of next week so that should take place now it is weather permitting so if everything holds we should be in good shape but we could have to move that a week just depends on how that goes but um, we are also currently um, literally nursing a water line uh, issue over at the high school as well so we're trying to make it through tomorrow, and uh, we have uh, dug a drain uh, right now because we have a water line uh, a leak uh, that we're trying to work on. It, uh, so when the, uh, the high school additions were put on and then the, where the ag building is, they did not, they just teed into it. So there's no valve. So we're having the issue that the only way to fix some of this is that we're gonna end up having to cut the main off. So what we're going to try to do is make it through tomorrow. We'll go in on Monday. We'll have a we'll cut the line. We'll put in a, a new cutoff at the main. We'll put in some additional cutoffs to allow us to kind of segment and kind of isolate some issues. Um, this has uh, happened before. We believe we know where it's at, and this has been a leak in the past. So we think it's just just because of the constant, you know, maybe what they call hammering when. 
you know, if you, we have a lot of toilets and if they all flush at a similar time, it, it creates a, a pressure hammer. And so that's probably caused some of this. We won't know until we dig it up, but we're working on that. So that is gonna be a main focus next week along with the roof repair. Now the roof repair is contracted out. Our, uh, our maintenance staff will do most of the work on the, on the plumbing. Um, we, uh, Mike reported already on the, the, the uh, this campus hail damage. We do have those reports now, so we are scheduling a meeting with uh, the insurance company to talk to them about what we believe is the amended claim in regard to the scope and damage. Of course, um, it's been dry, but then we got you know rain and we, we've exposed a lot of leaks. And then in addition, we have now the water that is penetrating the top membrane that's getting into the insulation. And you don't really see the water for three or four days later as it, as it works its way down through uh, the roof structure. So we're working on that. Uh, Mike also talked about the energy audit grant. So there's, there's basically 50 of those available. We just have to try to get our application in on that. And we, we're getting those scope of work. So we'll, we'll submit to see if we could qualify. Um, next month, we'll probably ask the board to recognize our maintenance department. They are in the process of installing the bus lane sidewalk. Uh, that's probably been a need for us for several years, but uh, we kind of noticed that last year we've been trying to work on some options. Uh, but I also want to uh, thank uh, uh, Jerry and Andy with the city. They have been instrumental in helping us kind of facilitate, giving us some advice, uh, allowing us to use some things. Uh, the partnership that we have with the city streets and maintenance department has been really, really good. They're assisting us with the ADA, the crosswalk access, giving us the expertise on that. So uh, Jerry and Andy have been really good resources for our, for our maintenance guys. Um, and you know, that's a, a, a fairly significant pour. We're, we're pouring that in section. We want to do it right, uh, but that, that takes a lot of time and effort, but it's already been used. And so we think that'll be a nice improvement. Um, we are also looking, uh, Mason and Scott will be doing some discussion. We have, that, that, that bus lane road is our road. And then the road that goes from the soccer field down by the new tennis courts is our road. So one of the things that we're gonna be discussing is, you know, is there a potential that we should be considering naming some of those in case we need to, in a conversation with 911, yes, go down Hartford and potentially turn before you get to the soccer field or if we could have a street sign that says something hey you're going to you're going to go down hartford and you're going to be looking for xyz uh you know bolivar street liberator way whatever it may be so scott and Braden came and then we're going to get mason involved in some of those discussions we don't want to make it more complicated than it has to be but we want to work with the 911 center as well to make sure that, that whatever we do is not just, hey, that looks nice. We want it to be functional so that we can get ambulances or fire trucks responding in the right place, especially as we move some of the fire alarms that are monitored so that when they do have an issue, then we're getting those people there where they need to be. Um, also, uh, one thing that was kind of brought to my attention uh, um, a few weeks ago when the early childhood center was built and some parking lot expansion, uh, there was some uh, 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 there were some memorials, uh, a tree, and some things that were removed, and then some things happened, and we really never revisited that. So we have now planted four memorial trees in a location that we believe uh, will be one better suited, and two, it's not like you're going to build a building there or a parking lot. So. It's just to the west of the new tennis courts, just to the east of the end of the intermediate. Um, but we have um, two spruces and two large pines. We also planted some additional river birch trees. Uh, but those will be memorial trees. Samantha King, Jennifer Burroughs, Rachel Gavani, and then also the tree that was removed was uh, Justin Fulbright. And so we have, we'll be doing that. Also want to make sure you're aware uh, Wilmette Monument, uh, Josh Laird has been really helpful to me. We are working with them on, on getting um, what, what I would say is a nice professional memorial that, that he's assisting us with and making sure that we recognize each of those individuals and it, it can be 
you know, well seen and it's not going to be something that we won't have a problem mowing around or those type of things. So uh, another good coordination piece, this will be something that we can uh, can recognize those individuals and, and get those uh, in, a, in a location that's appropriate and um, have their in memory of right there so that, you know, Bolivar people or visiting teams for tennis may go over and seek shade at some point and they're going to be able to go, I wonder who that was, and, and we'll be able to talk to them about uh, who that person was and what they meant to Bolivar. I know we're headed into winter, but will there be some type of like dedication ceremony, recognition ceremony, something with their families? So the answer is yes, okay. uh, but it, it's kind of taken us a little bit to coordinate. And right. So, but, but yeah, yeah, if there was a beautiful you know December day, then we could probably do that. But we, we also we're going to let everybody know, and uh, but we'll we want to do that and make sure that their those families are on. Wasn't until spring or something. Correct. You want to do that after the monuments because they won't do that until spring. Yeah, that's that's what we want to make sure that we're we're good to go with all of that. Uh, Jeff has already met with them. We're going to get the bases and we'll get, get some of those things. So I think it's just the timing and making sure that we're doing that. Uh, last thing is, uh, of course, this little cult spell did hit um, all of us a little differently. Um, we are scheduled to begin some curbing at Liberator Park on the north parking lot. Um, so they'll come in really tomorrow. We, they were really going to come in this week, but tomorrow, uh, we had two days this week that the temperatures were just really going to be problematic. So we went ahead and kicked that to next week. So we'll be uh, moving forward with that. So we should see some additional progress there. Okay, so now we are moving on to our review and discussion items. First up is our annual MSBA policy updates. And so, I, yep. I think I counted. Were you going to say something? No, I was just going to say we've received those and we went ahead and pushed those out, but you'll have these now for your 30 day review. Right. And so I think there are enough for us to have two each so we can all feel gifted. Um, okay. So. Paula, can we start with your side of the table and you'll take the first two? Yep. Kyle, you've got DB and DBB. Jared, you have DJF and DJFA. Um, I'll take, I'll read all of them, but I'll do the GBLB and IF. Brandon, that gives you IGAB, IGCE. Jared, JFG, A, JHC. And when we let Mike know that he's got JHDF and JHG. And I have those copies I'll hand out. Okay. okay. We'll review those and then anybody has any discussions and then we'll finalize that next month, correct? That is true. Yeah, well, you have 30 days of review. I mean, you don't have to do them, but okay. that would be the plan. Okay. Um, board candidate filing. That period will be December 6th through the 27th. Uh, we, our office will be open until 5 p.m. on the 27th. Closed, I, it, we're closed on the 26th, right? Um, right, I had it in the paper. Yeah, no. we're, so we're closed uh, the Monday, but then it's uh, open Tuesday, but it closes at five that day. Okay, great. Um, four day calendar update. Oh, whoops, I forgot. Um, ABC. Consider date for April 2023 board meeting. Um, because of the way the election day falls and we meet on the third Thursday, there's actually more days in between election day and our board meeting. You have to certify within a certain number of days. So we would either need to move our meeting from Thursday to Tuesday or, um, or you could move it up a week, but um, we just need to fall within that. Um, certification window. April. She was that okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. The 18th. Mm -hmm. okay. okay. That'd be great. Thank you. Tight. So last year, we um, began a discussion with um, a CTA and 
I saw one of the came up in calendar questions. We started a committee of discussion in regard to what does a four day what does a four day school look like? Uh, we we brought in Dr. John Turner. Uh, we were looking at some articles. We had some really good discussions. But at the time that we started that and where we got to a point, we we still really didn't know if implementing that and trying to get all the logistics was the right thing for us. So we, we said, hey, this is good. Let's pause, though, come back in the fall, re restart the committee. Uh, we had done some initial surveying, but there was a lot of questions that came back in regard to, well, I, I voted this way or this way, but I really need some more information. So um, we started this back up. Uh, really appreciated Dr. Garber's leadership and kind of facilitating those discussions. We looked at um, what a survey would look like. So he contacted Marshfield, Seneca, Aurora, several different school districts. We looked at some other four-day calendars of uh, schools that, at, and Marshfield is really, you know, be the only demographically sized school district that would be similar to us in this area. Everyone else would be smaller than than uh, Bolivar. So we looked at some calendars. Uh, we kind of prepared that survey question. The first group that we were going to identify was the staff. We wanted to survey them. From there, we would we would survey parents, and then we would survey community members. But the important part was of really saying, okay, as we approach staff, can we find any consensus on yes, it's over here or it's over here? We also prepared a couple draft calendar options based on the current number of contractual days that teachers uh, are uh, contracted here with Bolivar. One of the guiding questions that Tim uh, posed was, what does it look like for Bolivar? And so we were trying to figure what that would be like. And so we had some good discussion. Uh, we had a, about 20, 24 um, committee members from the different buildings uh, gave of their time and kind of thoughts. Uh, we surveyed staff. Um, we had a pretty good response from the staff in regard to that. Uh, but one of the challenges that kind of came from that would be is the results of that aren't, aren't overwhelmingly, this is what we should do. Um, and in some ways you get into it and you say, well, even if I take the undecided and I move them into one group or the other, is that, does that swing the pendulum for us to be able to, to take the next steps? Now, there were some valid concerns in the committee group about um, whether or not we had every question answered, or was there some information that maybe impacted the way that people saw or felt about the survey or the four-day calendar, and I think that, that that's a potential that we could look at. However, one of our challenges is, is that in order to produce a, a perfect or a near-perfect calendar, for, for all of us as school employees, we would still then need to go out and, and say, okay, how does the parents feel about it? Which brings me back and to, to saying, okay, at some point, even if we're 60-40, if we're 50-50, the issue is, is how does this look for Bolivar? Um, so I, I explained to the committee, I said, at this point, I'm, I'm not confident that continuing down this path is the right thing to do because there's so much time involved for those teachers that are working through that. I don't know that we, we have an overwhelmingly supportive response and there's some, some basic differences about where we might want to be for Bolivar in comparison to some of our neighboring schools that are smaller that have four day weeks. So at this point, and I told the committee this, I'm, I'm not recommending that we move forward with any further four day discussions. Uh, we need to transition to a, our calendar discussions. Um, and we also have gotten some good feedback from the survey, the 40 survey, about the importance of certain breaks, the importance of some of the, the way that we structured our professional learning, you know, in each month, uh, the way that uh, Christmas break is, is designed, uh, spring break. And so I think there are still some things that we can do with a normal or, or shouldn't say normal, a traditional calendar that allows us to meet some teacher and staff needs, but doesn't necessarily mean that our parents and community and our students uh, don't have access to school in a very traditional way of five days a week. Um, so for me, um, I, I 
think that it's important for us to one recognize that our teachers and the committee members that they did a fantastic job I, I I would like to have been you know 95% one way or the other but um, it does still come down to I, I, I think we need to allow it to say that it's not the right thing for Bolivar right now uh, we need to go ahead and focus on what that calendar so that we can start making plans um, we can be looking at schedules uh, we can look at athletic activities there's so many things that are impacted by our planning in the calendar so uh, at this point i do not recommend that we move forward with the four-day discussions but if the board has any questions or if you want me to look at something different i'm happy to do that but you're i mean just to clarify you're saying you're not recommending it at this time but it doesn't mean we're never going to consider it or we're not going to continue to answer questions is the com is the committee still a committee are they or is dr garber answering some of the questions like how are we moving forward yeah I, well i think we should we're going to need to have probably a, a, a closure i mean i don't want to just say hey thanks a lot in an email i, I think we'd want to visit that i think there are individuals in all of our buildings that are like i, I still want to talk about this and I don't think there's anything wrong with that. And I'm, and really, that's the important part of having a, a, a collaborative, high-performing school district is that we're going to be willing to have a discussion. It's just that I don't know that we can reach this 80 or 90 percent mass approval or disapproval. And I don't really want to get to the disapproval piece. I think that we're at a point that this is let's keep moving forward if we need to come back and have a conversation about four day absolutely um, i don't want to continue to meet every month with the four day because i think those individuals have things that they need to be doing and right now we need to focus on what that calendar is going to look like right i just know one of the kind of the common questions in the comments was you know what would the mondays look like and um there was con some concern about how it would impact the type of schedule they have at the high school, those sorts of things. And so I just didn't know if there was anyone in the district that was going to be working on what would the Monday look like? What I know you, they that, you presented. That was one of my questions. Like what, I feel like there's a lot of uncertainties maybe with the survey and that maybe why some teachers answered the surveys the way they did. Is there anything that we can do to clarify those? Is that yeah. Like yeah, I think, I think that would be something that Dr. Garber and I could kind of look at and say, all right, let's go back to the committee. Let's look at the draft calendars or, or one of them or those priorities and just say, okay, if we were to look at the, that two Monday per month, one being focused on our professional learning goals, one being focused on either grade level or department or interventions or you know, lesson design, whatever the case is, I think that's can be achieved, but we would really need, instead of that committee, we would need the building level principals working with TC in, in regard to, right. this is what our professional learning goals would be. But one of the things we did talk about is, one of those Mondays may be very structured in regard to what's occurring either district-wide or for a building. The other Monday it was is really gonna need to be defined as what, what's good for that department or that grade level or that group of teachers or that building, uh, maybe in the morning or versus the afternoon. And it doesn't necessarily have to be an eight to three day as much as it could be, we're, we're providing a, an appropriate amount of time for there to be a discussion about, okay, this week or the next two weeks, these are the students that we need to be focused on. Here are the, the intervention schedules that we need to develop for these particular students. Here's the lessons that we need to, but that, that should occur with the experts, which is teachers and principals in those buildings, um, and, and through a good conversations with Dr. Wall. The setting in Jared and Carrie was one of those meetings. I felt like sometimes the conversation veered off to, to a calendar, calendar committee, not you know, a four-day committee. Yep. I just want to make sure, I mean, I saw the results in the way, you know, though it was split just like we all did, but like, I just want to make sure we're not saying, Okay, we're not pursuing it, we're just putting it in a drawer and putting it away. And there's not that we're going to resurvey or we're going to keep having a committee meeting, but just are is somebody in the district going to still try to answer some of the questions that oh, our yeah. teachers still have? Yeah, okay. we can. If, if, if it's, it's interesting now, based on this, the survey results, we will also have to depend on CTA. So, what's interesting is CTA represents 
both people for it and against it. So as they approach what they want to bring in those additional discussions, I think that's how we, we openly engage that. But if anybody has a specific question, it, they, they are welcome to email me or call me or just stop me in the bill and, and or, or Dr. Garber. We've got a, a large Google file available to every one of those committee members. Uh, one of the things that we're going to put back out tomorrow with the, the district update is the survey results that the committee got to work with and, and, and the comments. And so people will be able to kind of digest that and then say, yeah, I kind of agree with that. And if there's a follow-up piece to that, then we'll, we will follow up. Okay. All right. And yeah, to reiterate what you said, thank you to everyone who was on the committee. And I mean, a lot of people gave a lot of time and effort. So we appreciate that. All right. Um, operating budget planning. Um, that's me again. So one of the things that uh, we discussed uh, when we talked about MSBA conference and then last night, uh, DESE is hosting several regional meetings in regard to the Blue Ribbon Commission on uh, Teacher Recruitment and Retention. And they did a, a regional update um, at NIXA last night. And they had also the uh, state board and the commissioner had presented some information in the MSBA. There are basically nine findings that that commission came out with, which are very, very important. But one of which is Missouri ranks 50th in just about all of the categories in regard to teacher pay. And when you look at Missouri in Kansas, Nebraska, Illinois, Arkansas, Oklahoma, you, you can tell that those those states have taken a different approach than Missouri and we're, we're really last in, in even those regional areas. So for us, we need to be talking about what, what can change. When they started the Blue Ribbon Commission, well, one of the important parts was is that they gave them a very specific timeline of when that report had to be back. And the, that was important because you didn't want this to go for a year. That This needed to turn around kind of quickly. Because legislatively, the only way that the minimum base can be changed is if the legislature changes that from, I believe it's 25.5, uh, and most everyone else being in the 35, 38, 40,000 range. So it's been, I think, since 2005, since the state minimum teacher salary piece has legislatively been reviewed or adjusted. Now we appreciate, now Bolivar's not currently participating in the $38,000 grant because our base is at 38.5. So that's one part and you've got career ladder, but those are, pieces that have to be annually renewed and allocated to. So it's going to be really important for us to go, what what are we going to do to address this uh, here in Bolivar, regionally and then statewide? Because it is a statewide problem. So one of those pieces is uh, we need to try to approach, and, and of course this is going to be a review item. I'm not asking you to prove anything. We're not, we're not taking any steps on this, but we really need to ask Bolivar patrons and parents um, and try to help them understand the need for us to develop high quality, recruit and retain teachers, custodians, food service. Um, we, we need a opportunity to do that. And in order to do that, that's gonna take some operating capital, operating money. And so what we're going to propose is a discussion in regard to what would that operating capital look like? 15 cents, 20 cents, 25 cents. What would that look like for us in regard to assisting with that recruitment and retention of qualified staff uh, and teachers? Uh, but the other piece is, is that we also, in, in some of these out meetings that we're getting ready to start, um, the budget is going to change in just a couple of years because there's there's a lot of stimulus dollars and I shouldn't even use the word stimulus dollars, ESSER dollars that are, are going to go away. And at some point in time, that's going to mean that we no longer have a, a subsidy to kind of offset where we want to where we want to live. Uh, so when one of the first things that I've talked with with CTA when I when I came here was 
where where does Bolivar need to be in regard to uh, well-paid teachers, well-paid custodians, support staff, and that all starts with that teacher base. We are now at thirty-eight five. We're still in the lower uh, partition of, of our demographic of schools and our, our tax base and our, our, our certified teaching base. We need to figure out a way for our base to be at that 40,000 level uh, to really stand apart. Uh, and in order to do that, even when we talk about we want to, we built the middle school edition. That's great. Uh, we have those new classrooms. We have uh, a new tennis court. We uh, started several years ago the track facility and what Liberator Park might look like. But one of the things with that that goes, okay, we can, we can want those things, but we now have to come to the realization that we also have to operate those things. We have to pay the electric bill, the heating bill. We have to be able to make sure that when insurance benefits go up, that we can say, okay, we're going to put more money towards health insurance or salaries. So. I really think it'll be important for us to have a revenue discussion about what that looks like and what 15 cents, 20 cents, or 25 cents would do for Bolivar. But I also think it's important for us to potentially consider not delaying that question because if, if we can ask our voters if, if they would give us permission to do that, we would also be able to gauge the understanding of, hey, these are the things that we want in Bolivar, and we want to be a high-performing district, recruiting and retaining very good staff, all staff, not just teachers, but all staff. In order to do that, we have to be competitively, we have to have a competitive advantage. And in this point, it's going to take some dollars for us to be able to do that. Uh, so I, I think it would be important for the board to consider that over the next 30 days. Um, the earliest that you could ask voters to consider that question is the April. So we have until the first part of January to be able to, to put a ballot uh, measure on, on the table. But I think that the board should come back and have some additional revenue discussions about what that would look like. We're going to have to ask CTA if they would be willing to help us in support of that effort. Uh, but we would, we would want to structure that language to be very specific so that it shows the commitment to Recruiting and retention of, of qualified staff. You know, the takeaway from our meeting last night with Bessie and what we've heard for months is is that this isn't just education's problem. It's not just a teacher problem. This is a matter of the survival of our community. It's a matter of economic development of our community. We've got to have well well educated workforce and and this is such an opportunity for our community to step up and and tell the teachers in our district we we value you our community loves its teachers and and i'm excited about the option and the opportunity Oliver has to be a leader across the state to look at the findings uh, of this study and say we're going to step up and do our part so I'm, I'm excited about that. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah, I think it's great. Okay, thank you. We'll bring you some more information. Okay. All right, starting with our action items. Consider approval of a multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan resolution. So we, we're working with Polk County, and Polk County uses a, a group to help facilitate those discussions. And we're obviously part of that community, but Mike, uh, Mike's been doing a great job helping facilitate some of those discussions and meet, attending the meetings. Uh, so we're down to that resolution piece, and then we have some planned documents that we've got to update, but we would uh, recommend approval of that resolution. All right, I have a motion to approve the multi-jurisdictional hazard mitigation plan resolution as presented. Sure. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 <coughs> transfer. Um, Chelsea and I uh, noticed that in, in the changeover to some banks, we still had uh, a CD at Commerce Bank. Uh, we were recommending that we uh, move that over to uh, our general account into one of the activity funds. Um, so this would 
one note that we have the CD and then allows us to transfer that into one of the activity accounts. Okay. We have a motion to approve the Commerce Bank transfer. So moved. Second. How much money is it? 30,000. Do I have that upstate here? Uh, you should, yes. Okay. Sorry about that. I'm here already. Okay, all those in favor? All right. Okay. So last month, librarians uh, and Dr. Wall presented some information about uh, a couple of our board policies in regard to questions, concerns about uh, curricular materials, library books, uh, any of those type of things that parents and or patrons may have a question about. Uh, so this is not, those policies are, are, are not changing. This is just clarifying and identifying the procedures that we take in that review process. And librarians have done a great job of, of outlining, one, who all is involved in that, the process that they take, uh, the, the, the pieces that they ensure where they, they not only represent, okay, what's a school library versus a public library difference, but then also making sure that there's a process to properly review the book that goes into an elementary library versus a high school library, or a high school library. Dr. Wall, anything to add? Um, they presented that. Um, what I would like to do is wait to approve this in December, give us a little bit more time. There's a lot in there. There's three policies involved. I'd like to look at our procedures that are through MSBA policy and do an alignment with the librarians. I think they've got a good, policy they've got good proce or good procedures excuse me written out but just really wanting to make sure that you're clear with the pre procedures that we're presenting because there was a lot there last month and i'd like to meet with them one more time if you don't mind and we'll bring it back to you in december okay so we'll table that until december mm -hmm. yeah. okay. and just as we go through that the policy is not what you're amending no. this is just the administrative procedure and so if, if there was a question, the policy is often guided by state or federal law and those type of things. In this case, this is what Bolivar does if a question or concern is presented. So it helps us, one, inform any patron uh, or student, but it also outlines, hey, th this is who's involved and this is how we address those things. Okay. Um, SPU facility use agreement for swimming. Yes, yeah, so we um, have been using the SBU facility. Um, uh, they are currently going to charge us. We have not been, um, we haven't had fees associated with our swim team and using the pool previously, uh, but they will be uh, assessing us 120, 125, Tim, yep. is that right? Yep. Yep. $125 per hour uh, to use the, uh, the pool uh, facility for our swim, swim team. Um, uh, Tim might be able to help me with this, but you know, for diplomatic purposes, I would say is that this all kind of came quickly, and we were we were requesting some information, so we were up against like the day before, uh, and then we did practice one day, and then we had to cancel practice one day, but we were able to facilitate uh, getting some approvals of some agreements. Um, and then we, we just need to try to figure out what our options are moving forward. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, it could be a good partnership. It's important for our girls uh, to have access to uh, the swim. We have 16 swimmers, which is more than we've had in the past. And so, um, uh, but again, this also goes back to some of our uh, SBU has been a, a partner for us, uh, but at some point in time, we have to realize that there's an economic uh, impact um, to some partnerships. And in this case, you know, I know we can't go out and build a pool tomorrow. I know we can't go out and build a, a football stadium tomorrow without a lot of resources. So um, we, we, we just need to continue to uh, be a good uh, partner. And uh, in this case, we, we just have to have better dialogue. Okay. Um, do I have a motion to approve the SBU facility use agreement for swimming for the school year for $125 per hour? So moved. 
Thank you. Any questions? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Do any public comments? No public comments. All right. Um, we need to return to closed session. Yes, I have the two items for you. Okay. So do I have a motion to recess the closed session? Second.